Well, well, welcome to Lab Life with the Air Force Research Laboratory. Hi, I'm Michelle. And I'm Kenneth. Hello, folks. With National Environmental Education Week in April, we're sharing an interview we had last year with Dr. Mori Baja. We spoke with him on his journey to become a space environmentalist, space junk, the future of space tracking, and Hogwarts houses. In three, two, one. Dr. Zhao, welcome to the podcast. Hey, thanks. It's great to be here and, and uh, always great to interact with folks from the lab. We're excited to have you on the podcast. You used to be a researcher with an AFRL, and now you've moved into academia as a professor at the University of Texas at Austin. Now, I grew up reading the Harry Potter books, so the phrase defense against the dark arts means something to me, but it isn't a phrase that I expected you to be using within your current career. Uh, could you talk to us more about that? Yeah, so it's, it's, a, it's an analogy I, I, I like to make because one of the things that I've learned throughout the years, uh, especially at AFRL, is that the really, really hard problems to solve can't be solved by one discipline. You need a transdisciplinary approach to solving these problems. And, uh, you know, that also extends to education. And so part of the work that we're doing here at UT Austin, kind of carrying that uh, idea and framework from, from the lab uh, here at the university is to say, listen, you know, years from now, we want the next I don't know, General Heighton to have come through our classrooms. We want the next senator or congresswoman to have come through our classrooms. We want the next person that uses a telescope uh, that tracks all sorts of stuff to come through our classrooms. And we need for these people to really understand the, the pain points and the difficulties and the challenges that folks from other disciplines and other walks of life experience in this kind of common fabric of space safety, security, and sustainability. So, so the common fabric is safety, security, and sustainability of space. Can we come up with an educational portfolio that has students from all these different, you know, Gryffindor and, 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 and Slytherin come together and take the defense against the dark arts class so that they can all get some common knowledge, right? And then that way, whenever they, they get their degrees and, and, and leave uh, UT Austin, the, the, the Hogwarts for, for this stuff, that in their jobs, as they're doing their jobs, they can keep in the back of my, you know, their mind, oh uh, yeah, now I remember when I do this, here's what I'm affecting. Here's where my contribution is and here's where other people's contribution is and that sort of thing. So, so that's what we're trying to do here. I've heard you describe yourself as a uh, space environmentalist. We, we listened to your AFRL Inspire talk from 2015, where you, you outlay the problems that our, our world faces with debris and junk in space. Can you talk about that? Yeah. So one of the things that I've really come to understand, well, a couple of things. Uh, thing number one is that for to a very large extent, folks within the whole space community tend to be very isolated. They tend to be very clicky. They tend to be astronaut groupies, self-licking ice cream cone, echo chamber sort of stuff. And that's not helpful to enroll the rest of the globe in this vision, okay? Most space people are like, oh, you know, I'm a space person. You can't possibly understand how difficult and how complex it's like, I have bad news for you. If, if people can't understand, they won't care and, and, and you'll get no action. So, and I think the biggest signal to that sort of stuff that I got was when I became a TED fellow last year. Incredible experience. Got my five minutes on the big TED stage in Vancouver. And a couple of things happened. Uh, thing number one is that that talk by itself has already had over 1.6 million views. That's more people than I've ever reached in all the space stuff that I've done combined. Okay. So, so there's nothing that I've done within the space community, even the AFRL Inspire talk and all that, reached a lot of people, nowhere even near, like completely eclipsed by the TED Talk kind of stuff. So that says something to me. The other thing that I realized is uh, I had a conversation with Al Gore. He talked about his climate change projects and all this other stuff, and I brought up the space debris problem. And, you know, the response that I, that I, that I got from him, you know, paraphrasing was, look, space debris, space is, space is big and it's not, 
it's not a climate change problem you know yeah we should you know countries should not blow stuff up in space but you know uh it's not climate change and so what i tried what i realized then you know as much as i i respect the former vice president is that a lot of the data that he relies upon for climate change comes from space-based assets so it's like there's th that there is like a whole not understanding the fact that outer space may be infinite but near earth space is not and we don't put satellites anywhere randomly we put satellites on very specific orbital highways depending on what we want them to achieve and there's no cleaning crew on the highways and there there are very few exits off those highways so they're becoming more congested and so it really underscored to me look there is a lot of work ahead for people to really understand the consequences of maybe not being able to use space to provide the services and capabilities that people are depending upon on a daily basis how do we change that well i can't just call myself an astrodynamicist because who even understands that like unless you saw you know the the whole uh, uh mission to mars thing rich purnell or whatever it's like it's like uh yeah peop what is an astrodynamicist right that's not really going to grab people's attention where on the planet have we faced dire consequences in terms of in environment and ecosystem sustainability and and what have we brought to bear to try to solve those problems and that's where i started and that actually led me to the planet's indigenous people as the first source which was amazing to me it's like yeah the aborigines have a history of like 65,000 years of looking at the skies and using that to tell them when to hunt or where what kind of you know at what time of the year are different bushes going to you know so they've relied on the skies for for 65,000 years to help them reach uh this kind of sustainability the mari in new zealand the inuit right arctic circle so you can find pockets you know people people in you know native americans as well so you can find these pockets of people that oh they're not scientists or or whatever but it's like no they do have real knowledge real understanding of the ecosystem they've understood how to achieve balance with that so these tenets or principles of traditional ecological knowledge that's the foundation for me to try to say here's how we achieve sustainability in space and we need to all accept that near earth space is a finite resource and as such let's extend environmental protection narratives that exist on the earth a few tens of thousands of kilometers uh, above the earth surface so that we incorporate space within the discussions of oceans atmospheres and climates so to help people kind of understand that better kind of uh, pulling back to what you mentioned beforehand when people decide to put let's say a satellite or something into near earth orbit what does that process look like and how do they avoid i guess you could say uh, cluttering up the space too much it depends on the launch state and and the thing is the requirements for launching something have huge variation in the US there are many different agencies and entities that need to put their seal of approval everything from like the FAA the FCC uh you know you name it there's a registry for objects through the state department so there are definitely many moving parts in the United States to be able to launch something but uh, there's some other countries where that's not necessarily the case and when you launch something in terms of the safety i can tell you that the collision avoidance analysis is um i'm just going to use the word barbaric it's not something that's rigorous comprehensive something that you can have a lot of confidence in because there's just a lot of uncertainty that's the thing that's really killing us is uncertainty the inability to very precisely know where everything is what it is and 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 be able to precisely and accurately predict where this thing is going to be at a time that i care about to the point where you know the national airspace is significantly hindered every time there's a launch right it's like oh well we're just going to when do you want to launch and we're just going to avoid any sort of like air traffic you know plus or minus several hours from your launch that's a huge disruption it probably doesn't need to be that but it's like a in the presence of ignorance we tend to be overly conservative 
to the point where it's detrimental to the functionality of of like an entire like you know system so that needs to be looked at right near real time like if we knew where things were very very accurately and precisely maybe you just say hey we can actually still have air travel happen during launches because we understand the envelope of where the rocket can be and we can put these boundaries and so it's still kind of a nightmare to be honest with you so that that really helps quantify it for a lot of people me especially um so with the gold end with this uh, more accurate uh telling or tracking of these devices is that kind of what your team is working towards right now as a uh, space environmentalists or at least people keeping track of what's happening up there yeah so I'll, I'll say this again it's like the focus is the three s's you know space safety security and sustainability but then the question is what do i do with my work how am i measuring myself what are my yardsticks kind of thing and so my yardsticks are three it's sets of threes. By the way, this is something else I learned from AFRL. Stick to things, sets of threes. The first one is transparency. So is the work that I'm doing quantifiably making near-Earth space more transparent in terms of what's there, where it's at, maybe what it's doing, you know, all those sorts of things, right? Uh, nothing hides. So, so, so I have a motto, a motto for my research program in Latin It's nihil arcanum est, which means nothing remains hidden. There's nothing hides. If there's something that upsets me, it's cloaks of mystery and and arcana. And that's, it's like, no, everybody should know where everything's at. There are groups of people uh, around the planet that don't like that about me, but that's just what I'm doing. So I think transparency leads and feeds into the space, you know, safety, security, and sustainability. The second yardstick is predictability. Can we predict how any group of objects are going to behave at any given point in time? And given a specific scenario, can we also predict that behavior? So it extends beyond physics of how the space environment, photons, gravity fields, is making these things move and twist or whatever over time and space. But there's a subset of these objects that are controlled by people And so if you don't bring in social science, anthropology, and all those things, you won't get it. For instance, we have an outer space treaty signed in 1967. Do all countries interpret the outer space treaty the same way? Of course not, because there's cultural context. There's like the UN COPOS, uh, Committee on Peaceful Use of Outer Space, has long-term sustainability guidelines. They just adopted that like last year, 21 of these. Is Western civilization interpretation of those guidelines the same as like Sharia interpretation of those guidelines? Of course not, right? Because the Arab Arab culture has a different way of looking at things. So I think that's the thing that's really missing from space situational awareness and this stuff is that cultural context. Because, you know, we as Americans, any behavior that is counter to the way we we behave in space is all of a sudden a red flag. Oh, this satellite is moving in this way that that is completely anomalous and erratic from our perspective, right? Maybe from their perspective, that's not the way that they see themselves as behaving. So everybody is kind of in this near escalatory, uh, you know, for, because they can't predict, right? Because you can't predict what people will do in a given scenario. Then there's paranoia. And then there's all these... So what I don't want to see, because I already see it in the news these days, oh, country X did this and country Y, and there's this kind of one-upping each other and talks about weapons and yada, 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 and all this other stuff. It's like, it doesn't have to be that way. That's not to say threats aren't real. Look, after a decade at AFRL, I can tell you, the threats in space are extremely real. And we should not, you know, minimize or trivialize that whatsoever. But not... Every single behavior that you can't explain should be first interpreted as a threat, you know, because it could be explained the way just culturally. But there's but but that's not part of the ingredient. So transparency and predictability. Right. The last one is and I'm sorry for being a bit long winded. The last one is, can we come up with a body of evidence to hold people accountable for their behavior in space? So does my work contribute to that accountability? And that's very critical. Because again, if people are saying, I want to manage this domain, I tell people, you can't manage what you don't know, and you don't know what you don't measure. And so it's all about, what, are it, what is it that we're measuring, 
how are we sharing those measurements with a greater pool of people? And how can we push that evidence into the public square so that people can use that to hold people accountable? So those are the three, transparency, predictability, and accountability. Well, as you touched on threats, I think it would be interesting for our listeners that maybe haven't listened to your uh, TEDx talks or your AFRL Inspire talks. What is the, the threat that we experience in space with all this space junk? What is the threat to our way of life as, as a world, as a United States citizen? So here's what I'd like to say. I'm going to make a, the distinction between a hazard and a threat. So I'll start with a threat. A threat is when there's some, let's say, we're, let's talk, talk about objects, but again, these objects are controlled by people. A threat is when some other entity or object has the intent, the opportunity, and the capability to disrupt or cause harm to this other thing in space, okay? So, so, so I started my career in the Air Force actually as a security policeman guarding nukes in Montana at Malstrom Air Force Base. And that's when I got uh, educated in this idea of what's a threat as a cop. And those three elements needed to coexist, intent, opportunity, and capability. That, and, and it has to be, you know, demonstrable that those things exist. There are entities in space that do pose those threats to U.S. interests and U.S. satellites and that sort of stuff that have the intent, opportunities, and capabilities to cause the lost disruption or degradation of any U.S., whether it's government or even commercial, space assets and capabilities. The hazard Hazards are things that lack intent, but still have the opportunity and the capability to cause harm and disruption and all that. So things like debris, micrometeoroids, all these things have the capability and the opportunity to cause that harm. But, but threat requires that third element of intent to be present, which can be very difficult to assess. And it's back to what I'm saying. When you can't understand and you can't predict what's going to happen, then you wonder what that intent is because there's no, there's no sensor that measures intent. And so it's like, how do you infer that sort of thing? Because your courses of action are greatly dependent on being able to quantify and assess the presence of intent or the absence of it. Okay, that, that makes sense. So in, in space, there's threats and then there's hazards. And a lot of your, your TED Talks were around the idea of hazards. So, you know, there's 26,000 pieces of space debris, probably more. I think your uh, visual that you had was this paint chip, you know, hurtling faster than a bullet. And, and if it, if it hits a, a satellite that supports GPS, you know, or, or other research, you know, what does that do for, for us on the ground? Yeah. And, so that's a hazard. Yeah. That, that's a hazard. And the thing is, is that, you know, what are the chances that an entire constellation of GPS gets knocked out at the same time from debris? Very low. To not say zero, but very low. However, we don't necessarily have a bunch of these satellites just sitting on a shelf like at Walmart that we can just put into a rocket and just launch when we lose a few. Things take time. Things are expensive. And there's no, there's no blanket. There's no aegis protecting these things. There's no, there's no blanket of protection that can ward off these flecks of paint or micrometeor or any of this stuff. And so that's part of the problem is from the things that are hazards, we only track about 1% of the hazards. So, so, so which is like, it's like crazy to think about that. It's like, yeah, 1% of the hazards are things we can track. So 99% of the things that could cause the disruption or loss of a capability is kind of like random bullets up there. We just, we hope, we hope that these things don't interact with the objects in a way that's detrimental. When satellite anomalies happen, which are not infrequent, then the question is trying to attribute the cause of the anomaly. Why did this satellite stop working? Was it A, the sun had a hiccup of energy and that's what did it? B, a micrometeoroid? C, a, a fleck of paint, a piece of uh, you know human-made debris? Or D, Amberland tried to schwack my satellite when I wasn't looking? And more often than not, all of these hypotheses can be explained with the same evidence. So that's the other problem is that we don't have one-to-one -one causal relationships between stuff in space, which adds to this ambiguity and adds to the paranoia and all these things. So I'm trying to, with my work, 
find ways to disambiguate all these hypotheses so that you can say, no, we know for sure it was this. Because again, courses of action are highly predicated on what you believe the cause to be. Uh, so something you touched on beforehand, too, that kind of ties together a lot of what we discussed. Um, space law is a really important growing field that we kind of talked about uh, during and before this. Uh, is that a major thing you teach in your classes? Or is that is there another course altogether you kind of work alongside? I, I lead a program in the Robert Strauss Center for International Security and Law at UT. And the program is called the, the Strauss Space Security and Safety Program. And under that program, we do a few things. One, we co-host space traffic management conference every year in partnership with the International Academy of Astronautics, the AIAA, and these sorts of things. So that's a pretty cool thing. Invite some speakers and stuff for that. Uh, the second thing we do under that program, sponsor short courses in space law, space security, and these sorts of things. So there is an educational component to it. And then there's a Brumley Fellows program where I get to mentor at least one student a year. And for the past two years, it's been a law student, uh, Dan Michon and, and Sarah Probst, and this year, Alyssa Gessler, and she is in the LBJ School of Public Affairs, Public Policy. And, and we just started a space sustainability program in environmental sciences to get at this ecological knowledge map to space. And with that map being built, I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, so with space law, is there a major thing discussed with the carrying capacity of space or how much or what the limit could look like for space debris and um, objects in low Earth orbit? This is exactly why I thought environmental sciences would be a good home to space sustainability because they deal language of, of, of carrying capacity. And the European Space Agency took a lead in defining orbital capacity, which is something that I use as an input into kind of extending, you know, the definition for this. But the World Economic Forum a couple of years ago put something out to try to get people to work on what's called the space sustainability rating, the SSR. And this space sustainability rating would be an incentive, not punitive, but we would be an incentive to launchers and operators to behave sustainably in space and kind of like the Michelin star type stuff, right? Oh, this company A or launcher A gets five stars because this is what they're doing. It's, and it's very transparent what they're doing, right? They're making their satellites very trackable and they're being very forthcoming with telling us what they're trying to do and where they're going and all this stuff. There are two teams that, w that won the RFI from, from World Economic Forum, uh, the European Space Agency, their space debris office in ESOC, uh, Darmstadt, Germany, and MIT, Space Enabled, led by Danielle Wood there. But she partnered with Bryce Technologies and myself uh, at UT Austin. So I've been working on the space sustainability rating. And so trying to quantify what this orbital carrying capacity is, that's exactly one of the things that we're working on. Uh, so that we can kind of make this kind of a, a global agreed to kind of standard, which would help us understand when that carrying capacity gets saturated, that should be part of the regulatory process, right? It's like you can't launch something here because that orbit no longer has the carrying capacity to sustain safe operations and that sort of stuff. And capacity should be something that should be able to be returned. You know, if you properly dispose of your object, then you can give capacity back to this orbit, or if you clean these objects, now you return capacity back. That's something that's monetizable. Right now, people come to me all the time wanting to say, hey man, I wanna start a space garbage company, but who's gonna pay for it? Yeah, probably nobody, you know, because there, we don't have established sustainability metrics. We don't have like a space traffic footprint, which would be like a carbon footprint analog that you say, hey, we're gonna put a bounty on this object a million dollars goes to whoever removes that stuff. Well, well, why a million bucks? Well, because it has this large of a space traffic footprint or it's taking up this much capacity. Until we can speak in those terms that are quantifiable globally, then it's not a monetizable thing. There's no marketplace to do that sort of stuff. Until you actually said the carbon footprint thing, it reminded me of like trading your, your carbon out, output. So do you look to what environmentalists are doing through policies and laws on earth. And then you're, you're trying to project it into space, but, but, now, but now it's it just on earth. Like, you know, we're all affected by another country's pollution, the, the way that it travels across the globe, but you know, space is, is, is everyone. So very interesting that have to get really the international buy-in to really make this successful. Your, your passion for your work really comes across uh, through the screen as we're recording this right now and, and, and through watching your TED Talks also through a screen. What really drives you? Why are you dedicating your life to 
to this cause. It's it's a very moving kind of thing. So I, you know, when I worked for AFRL, I started working for AFRL when I was at the Maui complex. And so living in Hawaii for four years, I was able to see a disparity between, you know, native Hawaiians and everybody else. And a lot of it very saddening, you know, to be honest. Several years ago, a, a good friend of mine, he retired from the military. We had kind of enlisted together and basically said, hey, I'm like the you know senior enlisted person here at the base here in Anchorage, and I'm going to retire, man. And you were there at the beginning. I'd love for you to be here at the end. Come up. And I'm like, oh, crazy. I'm really, I'm going to go up to Alaska to Anchorage, and I don't know about this. And, you know, my, my, my spouse, Cassandra, she's like, uh, yeah, you should take your son with you. Uh, Denali is, is, is native Alaskan for a great one. And so, so we want to give him a great name and it all of a sudden it clicked. It made sense. Intuition said, yep, take Denali and, and maybe venture off so you can see where his name came from. So I brought my son with me. We actually went to Denali national park and that sort of stuff. But during the time that I was in Anchorage, I saw a similar kind of disparity between native Alaskans and everybody else. And one morning I woke up and I just felt enveloped by a presence. I just felt I just I just felt like surrounded by this presence that felt very, very ancient and like in my mind's eye, like flashing within me, I could kind of like have this perception of people across the globe over many, many thousands of years and how in our current society, all the things that we face with you know, ecological instability and all this stuff. And it's like humankind has pretty much lost its way in, in, in being stewards, being stewards of the planet. It's like we went from understanding being custodians and stewards and having that responsibility to ownership. It's like everything is like, what do you own? Do you own your house? Do you own your car? Do you own your... And the ownership thing is like so toxic, it drives so much of our behavior, right? It's like, I remember seeing a bumper sticker on a car years ago that said, he who dies with the most toys wins. It's like that just epitomizes how ridiculous this is, you know? And when we talk about ownership, then it's about rights. Stay off of my lawn. This is my stuff and my this and my that. And so I just, I felt so sad, really. I felt so sad. And in that sorrow, it's almost like if I was asked by this kind of presence, would I be willing to do everything I could to help, to help humankind remember what stewardship and custodianship meant, to help humankind remember that there are a few people that know what striking a balance with life is all about. Would I be willing to do whatever it took to help people remember and spread that word? And that was it. So, I mean, that's a very beautiful, very spiritual experience. And like you touched on, inequality takes many forms, especially ecological impacts can really hit that as well. Uh, how is your team or how are you trying to make sure that this stewardship, this inequality is minimized in space? Or what is the goal uh, to help bring that kind of maybe trickle down here to earth as well? Just talking to people and hoping for goodwill that's not going to do it, man. You know, it hasn't done it so far. That's not the path. The path is to show people the consequences, intended and unintended consequences of our behavior and make that very public, make that very pervasive. And so it's back to what I say, nihil arcanum est, nothing hides, nothing remains hidden. It is my purpose to put together a system that can take opinions and observations about stuff in space, you know, eyes on the skies, and reveal everything possible about everything up there and attribute, attribute cause to our behaviors and make that evidence as globally accessible and as public as possible and then see what people do. 
And a very interesting part of that, um, like what we just discussed, that concept um, that you brought up before we talked in this call uh, in a pre-interview was the idea of this cultural heritage in space, uh, how that should be protected. Is there people who should be stewards that they're keeping that safe? How is there an idea that, or at least do you have an idea of how that's being orchestrated now or in the future uh, for people who may have you know, Sputnik, for instance, or very important things that were thrown into space beforehand, how those are being uh, kind of uh, cultivated? Well, interestingly enough, like I said, so a tenet of uh, traditional ecological knowledge is this kind of cultural aspect, but I hadn't imagined that I'd actually see this come out of our government. But like two weeks ago, Administrator Bridenstine came up with what are called the NASA Artemis Accords. So if you look up the NASA Artemis Accords, you know, NASA and the U.S. government has, you know, subscribed to getting people to the moon by 2024. And so this is part of this Artemis program. And the Artemis Accords basically lay out a set of principles that NASA is saying, hey, we're into partnership and collaboration. Any other nation states that want to partner with us on this exciting space explorative endeavor need to sign up to these accords and agree and agree to these things. And one of them is this protection of cultural heritage. And so, again, somebody's uh, junk is somebody else's treasure and that sort of stuff. And as you know, yesterday I was talking to Andy Aldrin, who's one of Buzz Aldrin's children. And he, he was teaching a class through the International Space University. And I was doing this space safety, space environmentalism talk to his students. And I said, listen, man, imagine if somebody from some other country went to the moon and basically, for whatever reason, you know, wiped away the footprints of your father up there like talk about something that would really make american people angry is anybody messing because the apollo program is like motherhood and apple pie to americans right but uh, i don't know somebody from nigeria or ethiopia that goes up who knows they might it may not it doesn't have that i'm not saying that they would disrespect anything i'm just saying that it doesn't have that level of emotional attachment per se and so that has to be part of how we manage this space ecosystem, right? Is we have to understand and get calibrated to the cultural context uh, of what we're trying to do as a humanity and respect these things. So something that we know we can help with our viewers to really understand a lot of this is um, after we're going to direct them to a lot of your TED Talks, um, even your talks before Congress, a lot of the major um, speeches you've had are surrounding this topic. But we love asking viewers as well and people who are uh, we're interviewing, are there any books or any materials you think people should read to really help understand this space more? There are, I mean, there's several things like one of them, like Secure World Foundation has a handbook for new space actors. I think there's a lot of good information there. I, it's easy to read. Uh, that would be a recommendation. Certainly getting into like UN guidelines and stuff, that's probably like too nuanced. But but yeah, there's like a handbook of space security by Springer that has like some good stuff in there. I'd recommend that sort of stuff. So those are just kind of examples. Yeah. People in, again, in the space community, it's very insular. They haven't really gone out of the bubble, the echo chamber, to really try to communicate massively to humanity about this. And so, uh, yeah, I definitely find myself a bit, a bit of a, a lone ranger uh, in this regard. Hey, just goes to show that the next great book could be coming from you or people that you're actively working with. So the horizon, ha it's very promising what's coming up. <laughs> sure, sure. And something I wanted to ask to kind of tie this back to the start. Um, so we mentioned a lot of Hogwarts, fun stuff with the houses. Um, do you know what house you're part of or have you taken the test? So I have taken the test. I don't like the answer. So, oh. So, yeah. So, th so the answer that came up for me was, uh, was, was Ravenclaw. Hey, that's what I got. So I mean, <laughs> I could definitely sympathize. But uh, were you looking for something more like a, like a Slytherin or a Gryffindor? Well, so, so, so the interesting thing is that when I take personality tests, I'm just very much, I'm like on the fence. It's like, I'm not, uh, at, you know, a lot of people say, oh, yeah, this guy, totally an extrovert, that sort of stuff, except that I don't, I consider myself an introvert. Uh, and people are like, oh, no way. But yeah, it's like, I, I don't like being around massive quantities of people all the time, that sort of stuff. It drains me. I need time to myself. There's this really logical, scientific, rational aspect of me. And then there's this very, like I showed here, very emotional, very much like guttural. I'm just so much of both. And so when I got the Ravenclaw thing, I'm like, oh, but I also kind of like Gryffindor. And I, kind of like this, <laughs> like, I just, so it's just very difficult for me to just. No, definitely. Yeah, yeah.
<laughs> no, I feel that. The first time I got Hufflepuff, then I got Ravenclaw. I'm like, what have I really been? So I think it is, like you pointed out best, we're really a mix of many things. So, I mean, at least it goes to show. I mean, as a fellow Ravenclaw, I can sympathize, but trust me, you got a lot of Gryffindor in you. So I think okay. when it comes to it, I, I there's like a lot that, that makes lot. us. Yeah, so I'm going to agree with you, and I'll say I really enjoyed, like, the series, you know, Divergent. And I, and and so yep. I would say that that's me. I, I consider myself a Divergent. See, that's a great, that's an awesome tagline right there, honestly. <laughs> so, Michelle, did you have any uh, final questions uh, before we kind of wrap things up? Well, some of our, uh, you know, walk-off music on our podcast is often, is there any particular um, researcher or person that, or or moment in your life that has inspired you? You kind of already talked about Denali, but is there anything else you gravitate towards? So, so in terms of, in terms of, you know, people, I go back to things like Gandhi, like to me, like one of my, the major inspirations for me in terms of how to interact and behave is the work that Gandhi did and that sort of stuff. I do see myself drawn to, you know, historical figures and that sort of thing. The thing that really inspires me, I think the most is going to specific locations on the planet and just feeling what there is to feel there. I mean, you know, being able to go to specific places in like Switzerland, or maybe it's like Scotland to like Roslyn, like Roslyn Chapel in Scotland. That's like a go-to place for me. Like if I want to become kind of refreshed and I feel like very heavy and I need to just connect, I will take a trip to Roslyn Chapel and go to the crypt. Not the regular chapel, but there's like a stairway that leads to the crypt and I'll just stay in the crypt with headphones on for like an hour. And it, it's like, it's kind of sad that I, I, it's like, wow, really you have to get on a plane and go that far to do that. But yeah, I mean, there are specific locations on the planet that do that for me. And certainly one of the other things too is I didn't, gr I didn't grow up in a family that had many means and many, you know, this, that, or the other. And so I consider myself second rung. I'm a second rung dude. I'm a blue collar PhD. I'm second rung. And so the thing that inspires me is people, people that are disenfranchised, people that have been dis you know, told that they can't be this, that, or the other, people that have been displaced, people that are struggling. Like that's, that's what inspires me. I remember you talking about you were a kid that you would ever thought you would be, you know, a, a professor, um, you know, working on the world's problems in space. What you shared before was like one time you you looked at the Montana sky, you know, and, and you were enlisted in the Air Force. You, you know, that moment to where you are now to me, I think is just really amazing. And I, I guess it speaks to that, uh, again, blue collar, second rung kind of thing. Like, those are my people you know, the security guards of the world and that sort of stuff, the, the, the people that come by and help us, you know, pick up the trash every Thursday and that sort of stuff. Those are my people. Well, thank you for joining us today and sharing your story and, and sharing some work that um, you're doing to ensure our future. And thank you so much. I, I'm really proud of the, the time that I spent as an employee of AFRL and extremely proud of being an AFRL fellow. And I'll always do anything I can to help the lab in any which way possible. It is a pleasure to speak with you. Thank you again. All right. Thank you, folks. Make sure to follow us on social media at Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, and YouTube at AF Research Lab. And remember, stay curious. Logging off.